Now that we've concluded our introduction to Java synchronizers, we're going to start diving deeper into particular categories of these synchronizers, starting with atomic operations and atomic classes. And this is very important because this is precisely what you'll need to understand in order to implement programming assignment 1b. So we'll start by talking about what atomic operations are, and I'll describe some of the key concepts that are associated with atomic operations in Java. So atomic operations ensure that changes to a field are always consistent and visible to other threads. That's what atomic means in this context. context. And you can read about that if you take a look at the atomic access documentation from Java. An atomic operation, as I've alluded to before and used the same metaphor of like transporter beam from Star Trek or disapparation from Harry Potter, is something that effectively happens all at once or doesn't happen at all. And the word effectively is important because it's the effect of happening all at once. It doesn't actually necessarily happen all at once, but the effect is if, is if it did happen all at once. And sometimes it's also referred to as linearization or linear, linearizability. The key point of an atomic operation is it can't stop in the middle and leave an inconsistent state that's visible to a program. Now, the implementation may be inconsistent for periods of time, but the program will never experience inconsistency. Any side effects of an atomic operation aren't visible to other threads until the operation completes. That's another dimension of atomicity. So let's talk about some of the key concepts associated with this. There are three very, very, very important concepts associated with atomic operations in Java. The first is atomicity, which deals with operations having indivisible effect. Which operations have indivisible effects? And I think I may have shown you this before. There's some variant of this. So let's assume for sake of our argument, we have a class called non-atomic ops, which is going to be what not to do. This is the bad thing. This is the counter example. So we've got a counter, m counter, which is a long, which starts out with zero. I don't have to actually give a zero here. It'll initialize to zero, but I'm just being belt and suspenders careful. And then I have these two methods called increment and decrement. And if this program runs where thread t1 and thread t2 are in different threads, these variables will get interleaved in some nonsensical and non-deterministic and undefined way. And so it's really unclear what will happen as a result of running this program. In fact, it might even be the case that you'd end up with some inconsistent value that's neither, that's, that's really not adding or subtracting. You have like some intermediate thing, and that's because a long is actually straddling two words in Java. It's a 64-bit quantity, and on 32-bit architectures, chaos and insanity can ensue. So this code is just buggy, buggy, buggy. Obviously, if we use atomic operations, we will fix that, but we'll, we'll get to the, the cure first. Right now, I'm just giving you the diagnosis. The next topic is visibility, which is what determines when a thread can see the effects of another. So here's another example I think I've talked about before. This is loop may never end. We give it a, a Boolean m done field, the value of false. Again, I don't have to give false there. That's belt and suspenders. It would initialize itself to false. And then we have these two threads, T1 and T2, and T1 is checking to see, or T1 is setting M done to true. T2 is checking to see if M done is still false. So while it's still false, we spin. And even after T1 sets M done to true, T2 may still spin because the state of the field M done will not necessarily propagate from thread T1 and its core cache to thread T2 and its core cache. And that's because M done is not synchronized properly. So its visibility is going to be an issue. And the third issue here is a really crazy one, which makes your brain spin a bit. And this is ordering, which determines when the operations in one thread occur out of order with respect to other threads. So here's the, here's the code. This is called badly ordered. Once again, what not to do. And here we have two fields, both Booleans, A and B, initialized to false, belt and suspenders, as we saw before. 
And now we've got ourselves two methods, M1 and M2. Method M1, let's assume it runs in thread T1, it sets A and B to true. And you would think once that happens, then A and B would be set to true for the thread that's going to be reading them. Well, as it turns out, because of out of ordering operations handled at the virtual machine and optimizer level, assembly language level, and processor core level, you know, the many different levels that we see here, it could very well be that B is set to true, remember that came after, but A is still false. And then it could be the case that if you read it again, it would be true. And so you really don't know what the results of this are going to be because it's non-deterministic when the ordering of these values will be percolated through the memory system. So even though A is set to true and then B is set to true, if we read B, we could get true, but A might still be false. Now that seems really weird, right? And that's a consequence of what's known as the weakly ordered memory model semantics of Java. It's perfectly okay for the compiler, for the optimizer, for the assembler, for the pipeline, instructions in scheduling that's taking place in the processor core to rearrange these things. That is okay. And that's because we haven't indicated we want these things to be synchronized or atomic. That's the consequence of the weak, the intentionally weak memory model of Java. Okay, so that's a quick overview of atomic operations. At this point, it may still seem a bit academic, and the examples I gave you may seem a little bit contrived, but believe me, they are all things that occur in practice if you don't know how to use atomic operations correctly. And that's what we're going to focus on throughout this section.